Welcome to another CEO Wisdom Pod. We have Christine Fraser with us. She's founder and CEO at Asimovo. We're going to talk about uh, Christine's background, tech, uh, the future, robotics, and everything in between. Uh, Christine is based in Randstad, the Randstad that is Netherlands. I'm in Montreal, Canada today, and this pod's going to be fun. It's brought to you by podpire.com. If you want to start your own podcast, scale it, I can help you do that. Just go to podpire.com and we'll help you monetize and practice your ikigai on a daily basis, which is interviewing a bunch of cool people, making connections and growing neurons at the same time. Christine, welcome to the pod. Tell me a bit more about yourself, what you're up to nowadays. Hi, Charles. Great to speak with you. And yes, you're right. I'm, I'm based um, normally in the Netherlands. Um, and Asimovo is based in Rotterdam, which is um, kind of like the second city to Amsterdam there. But I'm originally Scottish um, and today I'm speaking to you from Spain. So I think it kind of that also tells a little bit about um, kind of um, how I how I live and where I am. But um, yeah, all, all good. Um, myself, um, I'm the CEO and founder of Asimovo. We um, founded Asimovo about a year ago. Um, but my background way, way back is mechanical engineering and product design. And my whole career, I've worked in helping take clever ideas and turn them into products, product ranges, and actually companies, and helping kind of take that step through an idea, through the very, very messy initial starting points through to the point where you have something real and tangible that's a product, whether that's a physical product or a software product, and then um, commercializing that. Pretty cool. And how did you get there? Because you describe yourself as a high caliber uh, entrepreneur, and uh, I'm guessing you, you've occupied various important positions throughout your career, sometimes uh, CTO, sometimes COO, um, and product roles, sort of. So how did you get to founding uh, this business called Asimovo? Um, so you're you're right. It's um, when you're in a small startup and often part of the founding team or or um, um, helping the the person trying to found the, the the company, which I've also done a couple of times, you end up wearing a lot of different hats. Um, and you um, start off really helping with the product, but ultimately end up as a CEO or 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 vice versa. Um, and everything in between. And I think it's part of the mentality and skill set that you need at those very, very early stages of companies and how later that changes um, and evolves as you kind of build up whole departments that can then kind of take care of themselves um, and you can you can move on to next big interesting projects. So like for me, when you do a, um, my, my original degree probably, um, helped set the set the path I was on because that was always about um, engineering, mechanical engineering, making something work, being able to manufacture it, being able to make it at the right price, being able to uh, make it in the volumes and scalability that you want. But also product design, which means that you have to be really thinking about the problem that you're solving and making something really intuitive and and something that really answers a need. And that marriage that you have between kind of problem and solution and always worked in new companies trying to do that whether that was at a product level or later at company level and obviously startups that's what they're trying to do day in and day out and then you add um, similar design thinking to ideas such as uh, um, business models and, and, and everything and actually the frameworks that are now available which weren't available 20-25 years ago Agile wasn't even a concept then, you know, then a lot of that's emerged as being best practice since. So there's lots and lots of experience of actually doing um, and then actually applying that to um, lots of different problems from lots of different industries, which has made it a fun, a fun journey so far and a fun journey and uh, where I'm going. And Asimovo specifically, again, the challenge is, um, in robotics is, are at the moment very industry level challenges where there are no set rules for autonomous behavior. You know, even academia is still uh, discussing what all the steps of autonomous behavior should be. 
And at the moment, you've got lots of industry partners trying to, to move fast. So autonomous cars, for example, and they say there are six steps of autonomy there. But in robotics, there's lots and lots of stuff still happening in academia, lots of stuff happening in industry. Um, but the some of it's moving extremely fast and some of it's moving very slow and it's becoming a little bit disconnected. And that dr drove us to help um, and, and to actually found Asimovo because it's this lovely marriage of um, people trying to build physical things, but actually it's the brain inside the, the robot, which is all the software side of it and the intelligence behavior that will actually be the re revolutionary part of robotics, I, I believe. And so if we can find a way to almost democratize robotics or, or help promote the adoption and development of responsible robots by many, then the whole industry can move faster. And that's that's what led um, me and, um, and my founders to start the company. Okay, let's start with um, one thing that you said, uh, the brain inside the robot. Do you believe that is most exciting because of the recent development in AI or? So, um, if you think, well, why why do we need robots? Like, um, so is it because like so a lot a lot of the early applications for robots is because the job is a dirty job, <laughs> it's a dangerous job, or it's a dull job. The three Ds: dull, dangerous, and um, and dirty. So these are jobs people don't want to do, or or maybe shouldn't do because they're a bit dangerous. Um, and so then you need um often in these cases so the, something physical that goes there and does the task but in an environment that's maybe dangerous or or um then then the the, the ability for that uh, robot to make some decisions of its own etc become more and more important so there's a huge challenges to build stuff but we've also but we've been building um machines and um, for for many many years so you could argue that that's quite mature already but when it comes to the actual intelligence and um, behind that um, decision making, um, given uncertainty in different situations and different environments, or that how um, robots interact with each other or with humans, or environments that are maybe hostile, then that's that's very advanced decision making um, that's needed, and so that's where a lot of challenges are, and, and then that's where a lot of benefits can come from, if those behaviors are built out in a in a responsible way and by responsible we mean that it's predictable the behavior and it's and it's perceived also as being safe um so it's it's about then building out those behaviors in a way that many people understand kind of almost um, the rules of 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 robots and when you come across them what you should be expecting and what that robot is ex is expecting in return Right, and the hardware and software question, for example, because there's always there's also some big development on the hardware uh, side of things. If you think of the NVIDIA chips, if you think of, I don't know, uh, gyroscopes uh, in um, iPhones, the, the GPUs, the quality of the screens, the quality of the parts, nanotechnology. So there's also like a bunch of development on the hardware side of things. Why are you more bullish on the, the software side of things or are they not even like, are both sort of the same because hardware and software interact together? If you think of software in the brain, it's neuron cells. So what is software, you know? Uh, why, why are you more bullish on, on that part? And do, do you feel that robots will develop faster with the advent of uh, the advancement of uh, the AI uh, technology that we've seen lately? So a lot of what you're talking about, the chips, et cetera, that's, a lot of that is processing power. Also, battery technology is event um, advanced significantly, obviously since the mobile phone and now with cars. Um, so so that will only also get better. So again, that just means robots can go much further. They can they can therefore be applied to whole new applications which are presently not. There's still a huge amount of things still kind of plugged in in the background. <laughs> Um, and and moving around so a lot of the very fancy things that you see that's not necessarily always what's true but you and and huge huge batteries and and battery lifetime is only needed in certain use cases and not and not in others being able to easily recharge etc and then move again if it's not a time sensitive task is is totally fine but 
So you're totally right. It's um, There are advances all over the place. And actually, I think that is what makes robotics so exciting because everyone's been wanting to do this. You know, the sci sci-fi um, writings have been there for, for decades um, for as long as people can imagine um, how I could work and uh, alongside uh, machines that, that move and, and are intelligent and I can interact with. But only now is it getting to the stage where certain pieces of the puzzle, certain pieces of the system that needs to come together in order for it all to work are all advancing to the point where some of these things are becoming possible um, and and more will become possible um, in the future. Right. And does the cost of having your robot fall over and break, you know, like if you can have all of that uh, being done in a simulated environment? But then my question is, can we attach like sensors on bots so that they can make sense out of the real world and then reproduce that uh, with software? Is that like an infinity loop between the boats? You're you're right there. Like so, um, for example, if I if I'm in a hostile environment, for example, and I come across a a situation that I then don't know what to do, what does the robot do? Theoretically, like that data can be collected as you go, can be then processed in hyper time in simulation to say, okay, if you go this way, this is what would happen. If you go that way, that would happen. If you went that way, if you tried this or tried that, and you could immediately test out 10, 100, however, scenarios, and then say, okay, actually these, these five look like the best ones and that information or data can go back and, and things proceed. So there's nothing stopping those types of loops as long as your digital reality gap is quite small. So your simulation has to be accurate enough that you believe its outputs. <laughs> um, so you so keeping that um, kind of a physical world versus um, simulated world or, or the accuracy of a digital twin, um, keeping that reality gap small is, is a huge challenge. And actually building simulation using real data um, is where you want to get to because then you can start doing predictive behavior and um, predictive maintenance and other things. But that's a, a, it's a lot of work to get there and many small companies obviously don't start there. So you you start your your digital twin as an MVP in the same way that you start any product as an MVP. You have this, this starting um, building of the robot in the CAD, but you can also do the same with a simulation environment. It can start very simple and basic and the same as the behaviors, and then they can all build up and ma mature together. And you you then invest further and invest in detail when the time is right for your project. And then how quick could a bot self build itself? Let's say that we provided a 3, 3D printer and it, it stimulates, and then it tests against reality, and then it understands that it, it's not um, scalable, it's leg, for example. So it goes back to the lab and self-repair with uh, 3D part, you know, like that That seemed to be pretty quick so that it could self-build. Not sure how much sense it would make uh, because humans have a full understanding of this reality. So how quick do you think that could materialize itself? So robots are... Well, I are very, very good at individual tasks. So they, they they learn one thing and they do that extremely well. To teach them to to think like we do is 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 a lot more complex. But if you have um for example a a kit robot that's made of certain standard parts that could all be 3D printed or CNC um produced um using just pure CAD models. Um, and then th that could be self-repairing. Um, theoretically, yes. Like There's lots of literature about um, robots being built by robots, but then you've got a certain robot on a ma manufacturing line that's very good at picking something up, moving it across and putting something in. That's very different from a robot repairing itself because <laughs> um, then they have to understand very much so what is damaged, what is broken, how to access a replacement part for it, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's much more, um, so, but the robots being built by robots, that's, 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 um, that's what lots of companies are striving for right now. But that's when you have very specific manufacturing robots tasked with doing a very specific 
um, task on an assembly line, which they can be very good at, building uh, then a very completely different robot for a very completely different application. Um, so, Right. So let's say that I'm a, start, a robotic startup and I'm building a new type of drone that can go inside the buildings and so forth, raised, I don't know, 100K in pre-seed or 200K. Like how much does it cost to go on your platform and how obsessed should I be with your tool? Is it like my daily uh, software while I'm building this thing? Like tell us a bit more about the the pricing and the use case of Asimovo. Okay, so Asimovo is a, is a SaaS platform um, which is really focused around simulation and using simulation as part of an iterative part of a development process as well as collaboration. So collaboration is obviously super important. And if you have a team, how can you build a very complex system like a robot if, you, if your key team can't work together? So that's a big ethos behind what we do. So we assume that there's a, a team and then you build your robot in a very modular way. So you might have some people in your team building certain behaviors and others working on, on the, the test environment and, and, and running test cycles, for example. So. In the same way that you have a Git repository that's your digital source of truth for code, we have a have a, um, a a project environment which is linked to Git, of course, for those appropriate parts. But if you're also collecting sensor data that needs to be processed over here, or you're making changes to a simulation environment over there, so so our entire model is based more on a team collaboration structure. And what you're doing is you have the option to buy that as a subscription. So you're su subscribing to that as a team. And for that, um, that's significantly cheaper than a, than a, um, a software um, DevOps um, salary or whatever. So you're talking about a um, thousand euros or 2000 euros for a large team. Um, and then what you're, but it, it very much depends on the processing power. So behind the scenes, what we have is the ability literally to turn up or turn down your, the, the compute behind your simulations. So you have an, um, a virtual um, development environment and you have the choice for that development environment to be either in the cloud or on your local machine. And if you're using your local machine, you can use your local compute. But as soon as you have more than one drone in a simulation, you your computer basically runs out of computing power if you want to be building behaviors. So for example, if you want to be having five different drones delivering five different parcels with five different uh, things um, across a city, um, how do they work without um, colliding um, within the same street, for example? You very quickly would need some um, cloud processing power for that. And so we allow you to to turn that up and down and you can move to um, graphics card and um, multi CPU and ultimately also supercomputer um, compute power. So some of the costs are about subscription and some of the costs are about um, access to cloud services. And that can either be that we integrate to a company's own cloud services or they can use our own. And so that also affects the, the pricing and the capabilities. There are also, because we've integrated a lot of tools, there are some CAD packages that they can also subscribe to or some very specific simulation capabilities. And then those obviously change subscriptions as well. So what's the difference between reality and what we will find inside Asimovo? Um, so for us, like having hardware in the loop is, so um, having co collecting real data from real robots, for example, is a big part of the development cycle. So in your in your in your kind of DevOps cycle, you have an iterative development process, and we believe that building behaviors and simulation is a really good way to do that. But you don't want to only do that. What you want to do is also bring your hardware into the loop at the right time. If you try and test everything with hardware in the loop, it can get expensive quite <laughs> quickly. You don't want to crash your drones, understand the speeds and when the battery run out, what happens and, and all that kind of stuff. So you can do a whole load of testing and, and different scenarios within a simulation and then test the outputs or the final things with the hardware. You can collect data 
through sensor data from the actual robot and feed that back into your simulator to keep that reality gap small. So think about um, this being almost like a regression testing. If you've got a software update, you don't want to do all of that testing on, on a fleet of fleet of robots. What you want to be doing is testing that in a simulation, identifying any issues, um, then testing that on a, on a sample of your hardware before you would roll that out to many, if that answers your question. So it's not pre-established formulas. It's uh, data coming from my real drone uh, put to the cloud, or do you also have your own formulas? So where, where we're at is, is that we enable people to develop and test their own robots. So some people have got um, um, proprietary things that they don't want to share with anyone else, and they would just be uploading into the platform and then running. Whereas other people um, want to kind of and build more in a more collaborative way. So we also have more open source projects that people can access and build different behaviors upon, share behaviors and clever things that they've built that others can then just almost pick off the shelf and use. And there's more standard test environments and behavioral libraries that people can pick from and choose. And we also believe that there will be a community effect on what those standard behaviors and tests should be as we move towards more responsible robots and standard autonomous behavior. It's quite fascinating to see the potential of that, you know, like just from a capitalistic standpoint, like you've seen that the Giga factory opening, like all of these drones making different shapes and yeah, just for money, you know, I could develop some business concepts in there, uh, have my drones swarm and make some, cool figures, test that out and sell that in reality for like a couple of hundred of Ks. Um, that's the capitalist side of it. Obviously there's like real world application, but can you give us some cool use cases of some of what your clients have built so far? So we're still early days. So we only founded the company a year ago. Um, but some of the initial use cases, there's lots of um, robotic competitions, for example, which are running. And this allows people to also kind of do a lot more gamification around that so that they can practice and trial it and do different pieces and share or, or kind of race against last year's competitors and those kind of things. Um, so that you can kind of um, make it much more engaging and learn also at a different level. Um, we have a lot of um, people who are almost showcasing their their hardware. So if you think about all the different things that you need for a for a really big robotics company, some people say, actually, I can't build that whole big company. I'm going to just focus on just hardware and I want other people to build the behaviors for all the different use cases, for example. So what we have is we have a lot of people showcasing their hardware. So, for example, if you build a drone, do you want to then build all the behaviors that for that possible use case, or do you want to really focus on building those drones brilliantly and, and make more of them? And therefore you need other people to build out the different use cases. So what we see is that there's a lot of people with hardware wanting to showcase it. And then we have like people wanting to do different drones, doing different missions or, or um, a, a car park that's collapsed in, a, in an earthquake. And how do you go in and, and get rovers and drones to work together to find the injured people. So there's lots of really interesting things like that. Inspection up up and down windmills or under the water. And, um, you know, a thousand use cases that you wouldn't ever think of yourself, but um, robots are already beginning to be um, used to help um, in really useful use cases. It's fascinating. Where can people find out more about you, Christine, and where can they find out more about the company? So I think if people just Google asimovo.com, um, they'll find what we're doing there. Um, LinkedIn is obviously um, an easy way to find myself and um, just reach out by message to LinkedIn or via our, our website. So if they want to, you can just send an email to info at asimovo.com.